Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the North Aurora Online Church Service. If you're watching with us for the first time, we'd love to hear from you on how you found us and what we can do to help you grow closer to God. This is a very special Sabbath for us today. This is our communion Sabbath, and we have a surprise for you. If you're taking part in communion, hopefully you've got our newsletters, hopefully you're ready, hopefully you have supplies set aside. But if not, I invite you to step aside while we're singing songs and to get everything present for we're not going to have a sermon today. We have something special and we want you to be ready and not miss out. If you were with us last week, you got to experience the joy of a baptism. And it was a double joy for me because it was my son, Nathan, who was baptized. And if you didn't, feel free to go back and watch that service. It was a special service where we included many testimonies, a celebration Sabbath. Um, but Nathan was nominated this week by the board to become a member of the sound team. This is a position that requires a vote of the church, and so this is a first reading for Nathan. Next week we'll have a second reading, and we'll send out an email for a vote for Nathan to become a part of the audiovisual team, an official member. He's already been doing the work. Um, we also have another first reading. Uh, we have a We also have another first reading for Scarlett Wolfsfield. She is requesting a membership transfer from North Aurora Seventh-day Adventist Church to Sheridan Seventh-day Adventist Church. Again, we will have a second reading next week, followed by an email vote. Thank you for contemplating these matters and praying over them. I want to let you know that we are looking at the mitigations and how everything's going in the conference or in the state of Illinois and we will open up to in-person services as soon as we hit tier one. Um, we're looking forward to getting people back in. Uh, those services will be restricted so you will have to sign up again online like we were doing but look for more information in the email. If you want you can like these videos it always helps us out it makes them more visible, other people can see them. Um, place comments, let other people know you're there, talk with one another, worship together, send your praises and prayer requests. We want this time to be a time where we gather together as much as possible. And so it's my prayer that as we worship God today, He will bless you. Let's pray, Father in heaven, the earth belongs to you and everything therein, and today we want to come and worship you and, and surrender our lives to you and let you know that you are number one. We want our hearts to be ready to partake in communion. And Father, we pray that you will forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for being present with us, and we hope God will bless you as we worship together. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today we're going to start our song service singing hymn number 476. If you're at home or in church, help us and join us singing 476.
hymn will be hymn number 529, Under His Wings, 529. like these, 593. Thank you. 
Those of you who are able to kneel, uh, please do so as we seek the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you've seen us through these troublesome times, that you've sustained us throughout a pandemic, through political turmoil, through economic distress, and Father, that you've even seen fit that we can gather, even though it is remotely, together to, get to worship you. Father, we pray that you will forgive our sins, forgive our shortcomings, especially forgive our ill intent, whether it was to do things we shouldn't have or to neglect the things we should have. Father, we recognize that we are incapable of changing ourselves, and so we pray, Father, that you will give us a new heart, a desire to be more like Jesus, and a desire to be changed so that we will day by day be more like him and less like the person we were. Father, we pray for your continued blessings upon our congregation, upon our church, upon our families. Father, we more than ever need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We recognize that in these troublesome times that there's a great opportunity to reach the lost, to provide answers, hope, a future for those who feel like it's not even worth getting up anymore. It's not worth um, going to work, uh, voting, whatever it may be. But Father, help us to remind them that their true value is not in the labels they wear or in the occupations that they pursue, but in being your sons and daughters. And so, Father, I pray that you will help us to help others see what you see in them hope, salvation, and eternal life. Father, as we continue this worship service, I pray that you will give us a right mind and a right heart, and that you'll help us to implement that which we hear and be doers of your word and not merely hearers. We love you so much, and we can't wait to see you coming back to take us home on that soon and faithful day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi kids and welcome to Children's Story. A couple weeks ago, I shared a story with you that was all about how I had chickens as pets when we lived in Maryland. Now, that story was pretty embarrassing, at least for my part in it. But today's story is very near and dear to my heart and it too is all about my chickens. We had a beautiful little flock of buff Brahma bantams and they had what's known as a pecking order. You may have heard of a pecking order before. Most birds do it. It's when they try to figure out who is most important in the flock. They're constantly trying to argue about who's first. Me first, me first, me first. And the reason they call it a pecking order is that they usually establish this by pecking one another. I had one hen in particular who thought that she was above and beyond everybody else. She wanted to be first and oh, she was mean about it. She pecked everybody. Anytime somebody wanted to eat next to her, forget it. They weren't allowed to be first at the feeder. She would peck them away. She'd peck them for pretty much any reason at all because she wanted to be first. You know what's funny? Really ironic. After all that effort and meanness on her part to be first, she still only came in second place. Do you know why? The first chicken of all, the one really truly in charge, was my rooster. A rooster is a boy chicken, and my rooster we named 
dictator. That's short for dictator. <laughs> he was first of all. He was the boss of the entire flock. And he did it without any meanness at all. Now, sometimes when one of his flock was in danger, he might correct them with a peck, but only ever a single peck, and it wasn't very hard. Sometimes if one of his flock was going in the wrong direction and he wanted to turn her around and bring her back to safety, <laughs> he would do a funny little dance. He'd drop one wing down and he'd have one wing up and he'd spin around in a circle in front of her and then he'd go the other way. <laughs> he had some pretty interesting methods of being in charge. He also had some very different calls. Now, I'm sure you've learned before what a rooster says. Normally when we open up the farm books, you see the rooster. Everybody says, what does the rooster say? And we all answer, cock-a-doodle-doo. Hmm. That's what a rooster is supposed to say. In fact, it's supposed to sound quite a lot like, er, er, er. <laughs> but my poor tater, he never quite figured out how to say good morning in the full way. He only had half a crow. He sounded more like er, er in the morning and oh, we laughed at him. One of his calls was a very, very special one. When I would bring out a treat to the chickens and I would spread some special corn on the ground or oh, freeze-dried mealworms. My chickens went nuts for freeze-dried mealworms, and I would toss them on the ground. Do you know what Tater would do as the leader? He wouldn't eat until all of his flock were already eating the treat. Now, that didn't mean that Tater didn't like mealworms. He loved them. He went crazy for him. But they were so, excuse me, Tater was so polite that he would wait until all of his flock were having the treat first. And in fact, if there was somebody who didn't know that the treat was there, he had a special call in his throat. It sounded almost like a coo. And he would let them know, hey, come on over here, there's something really good to eat. And only after everybody had started eating would he go ahead and enjoy the treat himself. One of his other calls, and this one was a whole lot louder, was the alarm for danger. Now there's a lot of things that are dangerous to chickens. We had hawks there and foxes and raccoons. When Tater saw something that he thought was dangerous, his call went something like this. It was pretty emphatic and the hens couldn't ignore it. They knew what that call meant and he would try to usher them to safety inside the coop. Now it happened a couple times that something would attack my chickens and when that happened I could always tell where in the yard it happened because there were a lot of feathers on the ground from one of the hens. But each time that happened, you know what touched my heart so? All those feathers on the ground, I would go and I would look and there were always some of Tater's bright orange feathers mixed in. I'll show you a picture of Tater right now. Do you see his beautiful colors? Those colors are different from the hands, very distinct. And I would always find a few of Tater's feathers mixed in with the others when there was danger. And it told me the story of what he had done. It showed me that he had been right there in the middle of the danger, fighting hard to protect his family. He always thought of his flock first. He put others first before himself. And I've got a verse about that today. Do you have a Bible at home? If you do, open it up with me to the book of Mark. This is Mark chapter 9 
and verse 35. Jesus brought his disciples to the, him and he told them to sit down and then he told them these words. If anybody wants to be first, he should be last of all and servant of all. Let me say that one more time. Jesus said, if anybody wants to be first, ooh, ooh, me first, that person should be last of all and servant of all. Oh, what powerful words. Today, you'll see Pastor Josh and the elders, elders of our church having communion. And before communion, we take part in washing each other's feet. We do this because Jesus himself did it while he was here on earth. He put others first. He wasn't afraid to be a servant. He wasn't afraid to do a hard job for others. And you know what? He's first of all and leader of all. So I don't want to hear any ooh, ooh, me first, me first in your house today. If you desire to be first, I want you to put yourself last and remember to serve others before yourself. And hey, if a chicken can do it, then so can we. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wonderful example you set for us. Please put it in our hearts every moment of every day to put others before ourselves. We love you, Lord. Amen. Until next week, bye! Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm going or what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not every one of you is clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another, another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Well, good morning, church family. As we gather together on this Sabbath day, it's a high Sabbath for us. We're actually, as elders, pre-recording this, and we said it's a little weird not doing this on the day. But I hope you've had a wonderful week. As we gather together around the supper table to celebrate communion, Jesus invites all. We as a Seventh-day Adventist church practice open communion, meaning that if you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, we invite you to participate. Now, it might be you are joining with us today and you do not have unleavened bread and grape juice available. It might be that you are not ready. Your heart is not in the place where you feel you can take communion. The wonderful thing about doing this on video is that you can go and prepare and you can come back at another time and you can enjoy and celebrate this service with us. So we invite you wherever you are right now to bow your heads as we ask God to be present 
as we celebrate communion. Father in heaven, when Jesus died on the cross, it was the most tragic thing that's happened in this universe history. That God who created all things laid down his life because we were sinners. We've gathered at this table right now to come and to celebrate Jesus Christ's soon return. We've come to this table right now, Father, to remember his sacrifice. And we've come to this table right now to ask for forgiveness for our sins. So as we celebrate together, may your Holy Spirit be with us wherever we are. May we honor you. And may we respect you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to be reading from The Desire of Ages, a book uh, by the author Ellen White, and some of her quotations in chapter 72. So if you would like, you can follow along there. But as we celebrate communion today, I hope that this service will be a blessing to you. Though Jesus knew Judas from the beginning, he washed his feet, and the betrayer was privileged to unite with Christ in partaking of the sacrament. A long-suffering Savior held out every inducement for the sinner to receive him, to repent and to be cleansed from the defilement of sin. This example is for us. When we suppose one to be in error and sin, we are not to divorce ourselves from him. By no careless separation are we to leave him a prey to temptation or drive him upon Satan's battleground. This is not Christ's method. It was because disciples were erring and faulty that he washed their feet, and all but one of the twelve were thus brought to repentance. Christ's example forbids exclusiveness at the Lord's Supper. It is true that open sin excludes the guilty. This is the Holy Spirit plainly teaches. But beyond this, none are to pass judgment. God has not left it with men to say who shall present themselves on these occasions. For who can read the heart? Who can distinguish the tares from the wheat? Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not deserting the Lord's body. When believers assemble to celebrate the ordinances, there are present messengers unseen by human eyes. There may be a Judas in the company, and if so, messengers from the Prince of Darkness are there as well, for they attend all who refuse to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Heavenly angels are also there. They're present. These unseen visitants are present on every such occasion. There may come into the company persons who are not in heart servants of the truth and holiness, but who may wish to take part in the service. They should not be forbidden. There are witnesses present 
who were present when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and of Judas. More than human eyes behold the scene. Christ by the Holy Spirit is there to set the seal to his own ordinance. He is there to convict and soften the heart. Not a look, not a thought of contrition escapes his notice. For the repentant, brokenhearted one he is waiting. All things are ready for the soul's reception. He who washed the feet of Judas longs to wash every heart from the stain of sin. As Ron and I pray together, we invite you with your partner to do the same. Shall we pray? The communion service points to Christ's second coming. It was designed to keep this hope vivid in the minds of the disciples. Whenever they met together to commemorate his death, they recounted how he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In their tribulation, they found comfort in the hope of their Lord's return. Unspeakably precious to them was the thought, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Paul says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. Our Lord has said, Except ye eat the flesh 
of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. This is true of our physical nature. To the death of Christ we owe even this earthly life. The bread we eat is the purchase of his broken body. The water we drink is bought by his spilled blood. Never one saint or sinner eats his daily food, but he is nourished by the body and the blood of Christ. The cross of Calvary is stamped on every loaf. It is reflected in every water spring. All this Christ has taught in appointing the emblems of his great sacrifice. The light shining from that communion service in the upper chamber makes sacred the provisions for our daily life. The family board becomes as a table of the Lord and every meal a sacrament. I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we humbly come before you and thank you for your generous gift of salvation. We invite your presence as we joyfully partake in this service and we pray that it is acceptable in your sight. Lord, we ask that you bless this bread, which represents the broken body of Christ. And we ask that you open our hearts to understand and appreciate that great sacrifice. We thank you for this emblem. And we pray that we each hold on to you so that we may be with you someday in your loving kingdom. All this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. When Jesus had given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we receive the bread and wine symbolizing Christ's broken body and spilled blood, we in imagination join in the scene of communion in the upper chamber. We seem to be passing through the garden consecrated by the agony of him who bore the sins of the world. We witness a struggle by which our reconciliation with God was obtained. Christ is set forth crucified among us. Looking upon the crucified Redeemer, we more fully comprehend the magnitude and meaning of the sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven. The plan of salvation is glorified before us, and the thought of Calvary awakens living and sacred emotions in our hearts. Praise to God and the Lamb will be in our hearts and on our lips, for pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the soul that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us 2,000 years ago. Father, it's by his blood that 
through the mystery of godliness that we are washed clean and white as snow. Father, we don't always understand why we are called to suffer as we often do, but Father, in those moments I pray that you'll remind us of the sacrifice that our Lord and Savior made on our behalf. Father, he did nothing wrong. He committed no sin and no crime. And yet, Father, he humbly and willingly shed his blood for us. Father, in these times, we recognize that the last day events are playing out in front of our eyes, and we pray, Father, that we will have just a mustard seed of that humility that Jesus had, just a mustard seed of faith that you will see us through. And Father, we pray that you will help us to see the end, the goal, the finish line, so that we will be strengthened and encouraged to also let down our lives for your kingdom and for your glory. Father, I pray a blessing upon all who participate this morning in this communion service. Help us to remember the vows and promises that we made to you just as clearly as we claim the promises that you've made to us. Father, as we drink this wine which symbolizes the blood of Christ, help us to remember that it is his life, his righteousness, his blood that covers us so that we may in confidence and in joy face the world before us today and always until we see you again in the clouds of heaven. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same manner, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. These are the things we are never to forget. The love of Jesus with its constraining power to be kept fresh in our memory. Christ has instituted this service that it may speak to our senses of the love of God that has been expressed in our behalf. There can be no union between our souls and God except through Christ. The union and love between brother and brother must be cemented and rendered eternal by the love of Jesus. And nothing less than the death of Christ could make his love efficacious for us. It is only because of his death that we can look with joy to his second coming. His sacrifice is the center of our hope. Upon this we must fix our faith. It is my greatest hope that you have been drawn closer to Jesus Christ during this time, that you have reconnected your life to him. And as we close this service together, we in the North Aurora Church have a tradition where we collect a special offering. And this offering goes to help our members who might fall into a time 
of need. We invite you to give to the Membership Assistance Fund online or as you give to the church. We want to thank you for your support. We want to thank you for being with us today. Let us have a prayer as we end this service together. Father in heaven, we long for that day when Jesus Christ comes again. If our hearts weren't burning before, having a year of pandemic, having unrest, Father, we want to go home. We want to be able to throw these masks away and never wear them again. We want to be able to hug and high five and shake hands and, and sit close to our friends and family. But most importantly, Jesus Christ. What a day that will be when, when he puts his arms around us. Father, may we share the good news that Jesus is coming soon. May we share the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins. May we share the good news that Jesus has a special day, the Sabbath day, in which he wants to celebrate each and every day. May we not be silent, but may we be filled with joy because of what Christ has done in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Putting God first can be difficult. In this video, we'll explore what we can learn from Joshua that will help us put God first in our lives today. When you think about Joshua's life, have you noticed how many remarkable events he could see before his very own eyes? Let me list them for you. The man saw Moses challenge Pharaoh. He saw the plagues. He saw every Egyptian God humiliated by Jehovah, the only true God. He saw the Red Sea open. He walked through it. He saw the Red Sea closing upon the enemy's army. He accompanied Moses to Mount Sinai when God delivered the Ten Commandments. He was a spy who went into the land God promised. And by putting God's word first, he was sure the Israelites would be victorious over the Canaanites. Now, unfortunately, 10 of the spies saw the same thing Joshua did, but disagreed with his conclusion. By putting their perceptions first, they forgot God's promises and they were sure that the Canaanites were going to destroy them. Eventually, almost 40 years later, Joshua was chosen to lead the people of Israel into that same promised land. It wasn't easy for him, but Joshua was certain of one thing. He would put God first, no matter what happened. More than that, he challenged all head of households to invite their families to also put God first. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Have you already made the same choice for your house? Think about your daily family worship, about keeping the Sabbath, about teaching children to adopt a healthy lifestyle, and also to honor the Lord with their own tithes and promise. Joshua put God first, and God always came through. His example compels us to do the same. As we return the tithe and promise, we are challenged to put God first. Let us bow. Heavenly Father, you have called us to be disciples, and count it a privilege to be able to serve in your church. And we represent that the work of preaching the gospel into all the world is a great responsibility. But you have promised us that we would have the Holy Spirit to help finish this work. And so as stewards, we pray that you will empower us to realize that our funds belong to you. We pray that all that we do and all that we give will be dedicated to the finishing of the gospel. So bless us and keep us. And this is our prayer in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank you for worshiping with us today. I hope God richly blessed you. As you go through this week, I need you to be a missionary for Jesus Christ. God needs it too. But 
We've been given the territory around us to share the good news that Jesus is coming soon. I can't do it alone. I need your help. So please spend time praying. Spend time reading God's word. Spend time asking him how you can tell other people about Jesus. And may God bless you. May he direct you this week. May he give you wisdom, knowledge, and understanding through studying his word. May he prepare you for appointments he's already set up. And may he use you to share the good news that Jesus is coming again. May you be a blessing to everyone you meet. God bless, and we'll see you again next week. Goodbye, everyone.